And one of the key topics in operations is scheduling. And you guys are involved in scheduling all the time. This is something that you do. No, your mic is not working, Justin. I can't hear you. And my sound is up. I'll check. Oh, you were chatting away. Oh, sorry. Yes, I was. Uh, I was no, chatting I'm not away. hearing you. Okay. Sometimes these things can be weird. I will tell you that. I don't have anything on mute or anything like that here. So I think the problem is you on your end. <laughs> okay, you'll be quiet this evening. Okay, well, anyway, I hope everything is good where you are. Good. Okay, so tonight we're looking at project scheduling, production scheduling, scheduling in general. This is kind of where we are with this. And, you know, if you're IOC or if you're the government of Newfoundland or if you're the College of North Atlantic, Scheduling is so important because you need to know what you need to do, when you need to do it, what resources you need. All of these sorts of things come into play with regards to scheduling. And if there's one thing that COVID has taught us is that scheduling is so, so important and can get so screwed up so easily when things don't work as we're used to seeing them work. Say, for example, you order something, you expect it tomorrow or you expect it next day, and it doesn't show up for weeks. That has significant implications on uh, pieces of uh, of operations. You know, if, uh, for example, up where you are, one of those haul trucks go down, um, and uh, a tire blows out, and you had to order a new tire, and it takes you six months to get a tire. You think now, okay, how much is this costing? That machine is laid up for six months, not hauling 150 tons an ore of ore every hour. That's a lot of ore. That's a lot of productivity that's lost if we lose uh, production. So scheduling is so critical, yet it is it can be problematic, especially when you get into uh, issues of resource scarcity, we'll call it. So we're going to look at that tonight. Effectively, whenever we're in a production environment, so if you're doing something that involves production, and I know like mining is all about production. You got to kind of think about all the stuff that is required in order to make that production happen. So if we think about it, we need buildings, land, offices, factories, shops, these sorts of things. We need equipment, haul trucks, vehicles, computers, machinery, you name it. We need that. We need the raw materials. So iron ore, uh, what do we call that stuff that's in the ground? It's not called iron ore in the ground. I suppose it is. Yeah, iron ore. You need iron ore. Uh, they, they, you make them into pallets. Pellets. Uh, if you're in a retailing environment, you need to convert them into retail products. The cars that are made with the iron ore, for example, would be retail products. And people. Probably the most important thing of the whole mix is people. Because you need people to actually do the actual conversion, the tools and the buildings, but the, the manpower, the, the human effort is really what's critical in order to make those things happen. They don't happen by themselves. So active production management helps ensure that you get the right quantities at the right quality at the right time in the right sequence. And that is much more difficult than what it looks. I'm going to use the analogy here. I picked a nice, simple analogy, okay? The analogy that I'll use tonight to go through this is, let's say, for example, you want to build a log cabin. And uh, the guy I watch online from Labrador, Chuck Porter, Chuck just built a cabin. He went through all this. You can watch his videos and see some of the challenges he had with uh, production. The, uh, the cabin, in order to get it built, you're going to need some things. You'll need equipment. You'll need a chainsaw, for example. You'll need the material, okay? Logs or trees to cut down the trees to make logs. You'll need materials in the sense of, or land in the sense of, the trees to cut down and the land to build your cabin on. And you, the lumberjack, are going to be the person who's responsible for 
making all those things come together into a cab. It's not always easy to do that, you know, if you've ever done it, because you're going to find that lining all those things up and getting them in the right sequence or how much time it takes to do one thing before you can go to anything else can be a, a real chore. So what we need to do is really think about it ahead of time and say, okay, we're going to build a cabin. Well, what do I need to do first? You know, you need to think about what do we need to do in the sequence, the order it occurs. So, for example, in the cabin uh, thing, you're going to have to say, okay, uh, I want to get to the cabin. I'm going to get to building the cabin. You're going to have to put yourself into action. You're going to have to buy the equipment. Then you're going to have to clear the land. You're going to cut the logs, assemble the logs in such a way that you have a cabin. So it, it is a process. So it involves managing the people, the raw materials, the product, and the equipment over a set period of time. Now, we think about if we sat down at the kitchen table one night and we thought about this, we're going to ask ourselves, what do we need to do first? What do we need to do second? What do we need to do third? What do we need to do fourth? How long is it going to take to do the first thing? How long is it going to take to do the second thing? How long is it going to take to do and so on? So this is where we get into this scheduling type situation that we really need to do in production management. So effectively... You can boil it down into two basic things. What are we planning on producing? And how are we going to go about producing it? You know, what is involved in all of this production? So <clears throat> the basic objective then is to be able to prioritize what needs to be done first, second, third, fourth, fifth, and so on. So this is what scheduling is all about. Now, scheduling can work one of two ways. It can work one of two ways. It can work forward or it can work backwards. In terms of forward scheduling, that's the one that we normally think of. You're going to take a product or, you know, you're going to take the, the wood and, the, and you're going to say, okay, how long is it going to take me to build the foundation? How long is it going to take me to build a floor? How long is it going to take me to build a wall? How long is it going to take me to build a roof? So effectively, you work the cabin up in terms of forward scheduling. And you say, well, okay, if it takes me a week to do the floor, a week to do the walls, and a week to do the roof, that's a total of three weeks. So voila, the cabin will be ready in three weeks. Okay, so we'll look at it that way. That's what's called forward scheduling. And in terms of most of us, that's the way we do scheduling. We look ahead, we cast our minds forward, and we say, how long is it going to take to do each given component? And let's move it forward. We also, oh, hello, Harrison. Uh, we also think about backward scheduling. What backward scheduling does is it says, okay, we work from the, we need it finished by. So let's say you want to build a cabin. You want to get your cabin closed in before winter. Okay, so let's let's go to Labrador, Labrador again. We know winter is going to come in October. So you need to have the cabin finished by October. And effectively, what you do is you work the sequence backwards in that case. So you, you know the due date. You know when it has to be finished. So you're going to take the, the final thing you need to do. For example, put the roof on and say, how long is it going to take to do that? Then you work, how long is it going to take to build the walls? How long is it going to build a foundation? And you can work backwards and say, well, I need to start my cabin by May 1st in order to get it done for October 1st, I need to start it by May 1st, considering all of these items that I've thought about will take X amount of time, we just work the calendar backwards. So whether it be forward scheduling or backward scheduling, it really doesn't matter. The point is, is that you think about the processes involved, the sequence of the processes, how long each of those processes are gonna take individually, add them up and voila, there is your basic schedule. Now, if you're in the service industry, you know, you're saying, I'm not really producing anything. I'm, you know, I'm providing advice to someone or I'm providing banking services or this sort of thing. The way the service industry gets to schedule things is not so much in terms of I'm going to do this step first and this step first. What they do is tend to allocate a certain amount of time per customer. So I say, for example, I brought my car up to the garage today. They said to me, OK, Paul you can come in at eight o'clock. 
and they probably scheduled someone else for 8.30 and someone else for 9 o'clock and so on. So it works on some sort of appointment system, doctors, dentists, all these people who provide services work on that type of scheduling system. And it means that they can efficiently plan their day. The scheduling system really can get complicated depending on the type of product we are producing. And, you know, we looked at a very simple example of building a cabin forward, backward scheduling. But what if you got a really, really simple product? What if you got a really, really complicated product? Okay. A standardized product. Now, you might argue that if, if you're a seasoned builder, let's assume you're a carpenter, you build lots of houses, this is not your first show, or if you're a seasoned machinist, you know how long it takes to do things, you know this sort of stuff. So generally, you're doing stuff that you've done before. Anything that you've done before tends to be what we call a standardized product. You know exactly what it is, exactly how long it's going to take you to do it, and it's fairly easy to schedule. I, I got a ballpoint point pin there. You know, if you're the big company, you know how long it takes to build a big, big ballpoint pin or how many you can build in an hour. We also have another type of project called a modularized product project. And in fact, most of the heavy projects that we have in Newfoundland would be considered a modularized product. Uh, out here, just out in Bull Arm, out the, out the highway here, for example, we built a couple of modularized projects. And all modularized projects are, are two little projects or three little projects or four little projects or five little projects in as part of a larger project. So let's take, for example, the top sides of the rig was one project and the bottom sides, the gravity base, was another project. The gravity base was built fully in Bull Arm and the top sides were built in other places. In fact, the top sides were made up of five or six components that were brought, up, brought in from all over the world. So very much a modular type project. And effectively, with a modular type product, project, the thing is with that, is that this particular piece right here, the top sides, is built independent of this piece right here until they're put together. Meaning that the schedule for one and the schedule for another are independent of one another. Now, obviously, you don't want those two schedules to end at different times. What you'd like is, for example, if we're building a top side, you're going to want to work backwards. You're going to use backwards scheduling to say, okay, we want this to be ready to get installed on this on May 1st, 2017, which was the case with the, uh, the top sides and the bottom sides of Hebron. So that means we work backwards and we say, well, when do we have to start the production of this particular part or the components of that particular part? And then we look at this and we say, when do we have to start the production of that part, the bottom part? And we know that they're going to come together on May 1st, 2017. So we need to schedule enough time for this component so that it will be finished and ready for this part and it'll be finished and ready when they come together. So we've got two schedules for top, one for top, one for bottom, and the modules need to come together at a given point in time. So backward scheduling will work very good for this to be able to figure out when we got to start this part in order to finish it in time to match up with this part here. Now, a lot of products are built modularly, it's particularly large, large projects thing is, is that they can be bite-sized as each component, each part of the module has its own plan. The only trick is, is that the plans have the lineup at the end so they can come together. And then we brought in the most complicated, most difficult to schedule, and we've seen a clear example of that. Muskrat Falls is probably a really good example of a customized product. First of all, it's unique. Now, you say power plants are built all over the world. Yeah, that's true. 
But this particular design and shape is for the Churchill River at this place, just above Goose Bay. This is the shape of the river. This is the amount of water flow. So it's unique. It's a unique type of project. And the scheduling for it has to be done in such a way that this unique project has a unique schedule. And this is why the caps, like this weekend, for example, they this past weekend, they tested the LIL, the Labrador Island Link, with 700 megawatts. That was scheduled for earlier, but it couldn't happen because they had some problems with it. So the schedule got pushed back, 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 back. And in fact, it was only this weekend that it 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 met its um, I'm going to call it its uh, design volt, its design load was met this weekend in the test. So whenever we run into customized products, to be fair to companies like Newfoundland Labrador Hydro, uh, it is not unusual at all for scheduling problems to occur because everything is so unique that everyone's going to say it's the first time we've done this. It's a it has a, there are elements that are obviously done other places, but generally it's a very unique product project, and as a result, we could get some slippages or problems with our schedule. But those are very large projects, and they they require if you've seen any of the scheduling prod uh, any of the project schedule for these things, you're going to find that it's a very very complicated uh, computerized uh, system that's used in order to estimate the schedules. Now, if we're going to meet a schedule at all, we really need to consider from our small business point of view. If you're a small builder building cabins, for example, or building sheds or building houses, you're going to want to think about what your capacity is relative to the schedule. Like if, for example, you think you can build a cabin in three weeks, well, that's fine. But you have to ask yourself, do you have enough people working to get that done in three weeks? What is the capacity of your workers? You know, if, if one worker, for example, can put up or cut three logs and install three logs a day and the cabin has 300 logs, you know that it's gonna take 100 days. Now, if you got 10 workers, you can cut that down. So you can, you know, depending on how many workers you add to it or depending on how much resources you put to it, that's gonna affect the schedule. But you know that you cannot really change the amount of resources you put into things really easily. You've got a certain number of workers, you can hire more people, but that takes time. Or you can get a bigger plant, that takes time. You need to consider with regards to scheduling what your capacity is. So if you can only produce one building a year, your capacity is one building a year. So you can't change, you know, your schedule has to consider what your capacity is, how many hours a day you're working, or how, uh, how many things like that. So the capacity of your productive resources is absolutely critical to consider whenever you're building a schedule, if you want the schedule to be relevant at all. You know, so you really need to consider how much you can produce in a, a day or a week or a month or a year in order to be able to uh, consider a, a reasonable schedule. So here's the nuts and bolts. Of you say, okay, this is all good talk. This is all good talk, no schedule, and it all makes sense. It does. How do we do it? What, what, are, what is a good tool that we can use in order to do scheduling and to do it reasonably well? well I'm going to introduce you to a, a simple concept called Gantt charts, designed by a, uh, an engineer by the name of Henry Gantt. And what the Gantt chart has you do is to, first of all, do some homework. Okay, we need to do some homework and we ask, we need to answer some basic questions. And here are the basic questions. What is the task or tasks that need to be completed? What is the most important task? In other words, let's think about what needs to be done first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth. So we need to sequence them. So we're gonna do the, the most important task in building a cabin, let's say, for example, is to clear the land. Because you can't do anything unless the land is clear. Then what's the next most important class? Well, to put down the foundation, because no sense to put a roof on unless you got a foundation. These sorts of things, right? That's what I mean by rank the task. Then you need to determine what time it's going to take 
to do each of those tasks. Now, again, experience is a really good tool here to be able to use this because you're gonna be able to guess if you've never done it before, you're gonna be able to tell if you've done it before. So your experience is really gonna tell you about the time requirements. And normally people always underestimate how long it takes to do things. From there, we would develop a workable schedule. So, you know, this is, this is a, it's not rocket science in terms of the, the terminal, the, 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 the basic concept, but you do have to actively think about these basic questions being answered first. So, and, and your own time management, your own capacity is going to come into play here. You know, how much can you do in a given day? Is it fair to assume that you can do this much work in a given day in order to estimate the time? So during the wars, during World War II in particular, there were all kinds of problems and all kinds of issues with getting the right product to the right people at the right time, and time was of the essence. So a lot of research was done into how long it takes to do things, effectively. So Henry Gant was an, an engineer, an industrial engineer was the type of engineer he was, and he came up with the concept of basically Listing tasks, that was, that was effectively what he did. So here you can see, for example, here are the steps in doing something, okay? This is uh, building a house, for example, foundation, and the foundation work, you need to clear the site, excavate, pour concrete. So you've got subtasks sub within here, uh, brickwork, plastering, and, and so on. So you can see it right down through uh, building, electrical, plumbing, finishing. So it, it runs a natural sequence of events. And what Gantt did to really, you know, the power of this was saying, okay, how long does it take to do each of those subtasks or tasks? So for example, clearing site, one day. Excavating, one day. Pour concrete, three hours. Foundation complete, zero days, it wouldn't take any time to do that. We tally that up and we get 5.38 days. In fact, there's more decimal places, so five days, eight days to do brickwork, four hours to do, so it's a combination of hours or dates, but we need to be able to add up basically, you'll see the dark numbers here, represent uh, the, the bold, represent how much a, a, a subgroup of tasks. The total days then would be 18.25 days. So what Gantt did is he said, well, you know, assuming with the amount of resources we have, the capacity we have, it will take 18 and a quarter days to build a house. Okay. Then the genius of what Gantt did was say, okay, look, what we'll do is we will graphically draw this out. Here's the date. You can see the calendar dates there. And so the total time is represented by the top line and the subline. So foundation work. So for example, this needs to be done before this. This can't start before this. Notice there's a hard line here. Then there's drawing time, I suppose, for whatever. It takes a bit of time here to do this, and then it will go down to that. So effectively, one thing leads into another thing, which leads into another thing, which leads into another thing. And that takes a total amount of time, a given amount of time to do the foundation work. And then the brickwork, for example, you can see that takes a longer period of time. That needs to be done before we move into plastering and interior walls. Interior walls happen right here after the brickwork's done. Now, while the brickwork is being done and the plastering, uh, once the brickwork is done and the plastering is done, you can actually do uh, window frames at the same time. So notice that these times sit on top of one another. Some things can be done concurrently. For example, someone's working at the bricks while someone goes and puts in window frames, that sort of thing. So effectively, some of the work can be done on at the same time. This is where we see the blocks on top of one another. So this sequence gets done and it will give you a total time. Now there's all kinds of computer technology out there, computer programs called, you know, for example, Microsoft offers one called 
uh, Microsoft uh, project. And uh, it will do all this work for you. It will graphically draw it out. Now, again, you say, well, that's fine, Mr. Gant. You've come up with a great little a drawing there. But one of the powers in this is, let's say, for example, you're building a house and you need to think about when do I need to make sure the plumbers are here? Okay, I don't need the plumbers right yet. When I start my house, plumbers don't need to be really booked in until, um, in this case, sometime in June. So you can go to your plumbing trades and say, come in then. That's when I need you. So you can start scheduling your employees. So they're not there twiddling their thumbs. You know that you need them from this state to this state. And this is an efficient way to work. Okay, makes for an efficient way of work. So if we take the Gantt chart, we can actually do a lot of that and save a lot of trouble with regards to figuring out what we need and when. So we got to identify the major steps, range the steps, determine the path, and estimate the total time required through knowing what each step. So they're useful for planning and scheduling. So let's let's look at an example. So uh, they're just planning charts, horizontal bars, graphically illustrate. When you set up a Gantt chart, you need to think about the tasks. And you move to the right in terms of time. Tasks can occur simultaneously. The ones that overlap, for example, you can put in windows and plaster at the same time. Um, as part of the process, you can indicate who's responsible for each task and how long it's going to take to do the task. So again, you can bring in different traits. So the basic step, determine and list the essential tasks of a project. So step one, let's just take a look at step one. We want to build a cabin. So step one, determine and list the essential tasks of a project. So here we have this first step. What do I need to do first? Well, effectively, I need to find some land, don't I, if I'm going to build a cabin. So we're going to think about, uh, you know, what what type of stuff am I going to need to do in this first step to think about a cap? I need to select a building plan. I need to secure land. I need to clear the land and cut the logs, remove, remove the barracks from the logs. I need to install the foundation to build the walls, to install the walls and the door, to install the roof, install the heating system. So those are the basic things I need to do in my plan. Okay. So... Step two, then, is to determine the task relationship. So what is first, what is second, what can be done at the same time, and so on. So in this particular instance, I'm going to build a cabin. I can select the building plan. I'm going to do that first. Why do I need to do that first? I need to know how big a piece of land I'm going to need. I'm going to need to know, you know, how deep a hole I'm going to have to put in the ground or how big the hole is going to have, you know, these sorts of things you need to determine. So the building plan is going to tell you all that. That's what you're going to do first. Then you need to go get a piece of land that will fit that building. You know, um, theoretically, there's nothing to stop you from looking at the building plan and pieces of land at the same time. You, you could theoretically do those things at the same time. You could be driving along looking at building plans on your way to look for a piece of land. Now, clearing the land, you can't clear the land until you get the land, okay? So the land clearing is got to be started after you've bought or secured the land. Now, cutting the logs. If you're clearing the land, and there's logs on the land, you're effectively cutting logs at the same time that you're clearing the land. Okay? So those things could be done simultaneously. To some degree, there might be some independent issues, but basically you, you can do those things at the same time. Remove the barks from the log. You can't take the bark off the logs until you cut the trees. Okay? I've never seen anyone try to bark logs while it's still a tree. Uh, so you'll need to cut logs first. Foundation. As I say, the foundation needs to be done for, in terms of the actual construction, you got to put the foundation up first. You can't do walls, you can't do windows, you can't do a roof without a foundation. You can build the walls. That needs to be done after the foundation. Install the windows and doors. Again, 
maybe you, maybe to some degree you can put walls and windows up at the same time, but generally you got to have your walls up first. Install the roof. You can't put a roof on until the walls are up. And the heating system, you need it, need it really closed in or to put the heating system in. So um, then we associate of each of those components that we just laid out, we can associate a time with it. How long is it going to take to build, uh, select the building plan? A week. How long is it going to take to secure the land? A week. Clear the land? A week. Cut the logs? Three weeks. Remove the barks? Will take a week. Install the floor? A week. Build the walls? A week. Install the windows and doors? A week. Install the roof? A week and it will take a week to install the heating system. So we've got a bunch of weeks there. I, I just made it very simple. Now, the thing is, the stuff that they, you know, if you say, well, I got a week for each of the events and it's 10 items, 10 weeks, but that's not the case because some of the items we can do sequentially or some of the items we can do in parallel. And we can see this if we, we can actually draw a Gantt chart using a spreadsheet very easily. So here are the 10 tests laid down. Here's the times that we determined that we could do it. And we can start building our Gantt chart. And a Gantt chart, as I say, the, the, the picture or the, the, the graphic is really what tells us how long it's going to take to do it. So let's take, for example, this here and we assume the plan to build a week and secure the land. We can do the planning and the securing at the same time. They both take a week, but they occur in the same week. Clear the land and cut the logs. Let's just say, clearing the land and cutting the logs, the land is not big enough to make enough log or get enough logs to cut, but certainly it will contribute to that. So there's a certain portion of this that will get an overlap, you know, we'll cut and clear at the same time. And then we need another couple of weeks of cutting. Okay. We can't build anything until we get logs cut. The bark from the logs, let's assume that that can only be done when we get enough logs. So there is some commonality there. We can get a little bit of overlap in the third week, for example. We finish off cutting our logs, but we're cutting uh, the bark off the trees at the same time. We need to do all this before we actually get to build the thing. So in order to build the thing, we've got all this done. We've got our logs all piled up. Now we're gonna install the floor and foundation. That's gonna take a week. We can't put walls up until that's finished. So we'll build the walls, we can't put a roof on, we can't install the windows until the walls are up. We can't install the roof until the, the windows are in. And we can't install the heating system until all that's done. So taken together then, looking at what we can do sequentially and what we can do, uh, what we can do in parallel, it you can see that it's gonna take us nine weeks to build that cabin considering the resources we have, okay? So that will give you a total estimated project time. Companies are doing this all the time. I've seen uh, a, a huge Gantt chart for the building of the oil rig, for example, in Bolarum, and the fact that it was really two different sets of Gantt charts coming together in sequence, and then it was one Gantt chart when they were all put together. We're gonna constantly, you know, this is ideal. Again, we, we've made this plan on paper. The reality is the real world and paper don't necessarily line up. So what we gotta do is constantly review our plan. And in fact, the great thing about doing this in a computer is very easy to change the plan or adjust it to reflect reality. And it will automatically adjust to calculate an end date uh, for your scheduling. So by constantly reviewing the schedule against the progress, you can make the schedule to reflect the early and the latest completion of tasks, how long it's gonna to take to do things. Uh, that way you can think about when you order materials, like for example, in the, in the building case uh, for the cabin, you don't have to worry about a heating system until week eight, so eight weeks in. Now, if it takes you eight weeks to, to order and receive a furnace, you need to order right away when you start your cabin so that on that eighth week, it shows up. But it, it certainly helps ordering materials, scheduling trades and sub-trades, and basically saves money. It, it saves money to do this planning up front. 
So that's the basic concept of scheduling. And that comes into play in a lot of businesses and a good tool to be able to use, particularly this concept of a Gantt chart, for any type of production process or any type of process that involves a series of steps. And it certainly helps you be able to do a better job and save you money in the long term by having some concept of how to do a Gantt chart. The discussion topic for this particular unit is a reinforcer on that where I ask you to think about some project that you want to build and develop a Gantt chart for it. If you do that, you got a good handle on how to do these Gantt charts and how useful they can be in some application that you're going to use. Any questions?